Okay, so today we're going to pick up in verse 23 and try to make it through verse 38. And I'm going to try to give you four more principles to practice from verses 23 through verse 38. 23 through 38. Look at verse number 23. Jesus says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, meaning that the gift that they would bring to the priest to offer on their behalf to God, to you, that, that's what it meant to the Jews, to you and I. He's saying before you bring your sacrifice of praise, before you bring your tithe, your offering, before you come to church to get your shout, your praise on, there's something I want you to do. I want you to take inventory. Notice what he said. When thou, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and thou rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, watch what he says, leave there thy gift before the altar. Go thy way, first be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. So what is he saying to us, to the Jews? He was saying when you bring your offering to the priest to offer, make sure you get right with your brother before you do it. To us, he's saying before you, as grandmama and them say, hi tail, yo tail to the church, talking about I'm going to get my praise on, I'm going to get my worship on, I'm going to offer God sacrifices of praise. Here's the point. Clean up what you messed up. Okay, y'all got mighty quiet then. Here's, uh, that's the first point that you can practice a principle you can practice if you messed it up then you go back and clean it up before you come talking about give your praise and give your honor and give your worship and give your tithe and give your offering unto God Jesus is saying that you first must go and make it right with your brother. Now, please understand the text, Evangelist, because we get this thing wrong. We act like this, Reverend Zimmerman, is, uh, is referring to Matthew 18 and 15, where Jesus says, if thy brother, uh, if you have aught against your brother, if your brother has offended you, if he made you, uh, uh, if your brother had done you wrong, you go to him and you try to reconcile. This has nothing to do with what your brother did to you, Deacon Chairman. This has everything to do with what you've done to your brother this has nothing to do with somebody that has offended you snoop this has something to do with somebody you have offended and ain't no need of y'all sitting there looking at me like saints never offend in, offend anybody fact of the matter is you can have church go and say sanctified and feel with the holy folks some of the meanest low down cruelest evil folk you will ever meet as a matter of fact all of us Got a got, all of us have a low down side to us. Okay, y'all want to act? Oh, okay, can, do I need to come down your alley? I said all of us can be mean, all of us can be hateful, all of us can be low down, all of us can cuss somebody out, all of us can have a bad day. See the reason with some of you all. The problem with some of you all is you won't admit when you've done wrong. And let me help somebody. It's a fool that will never say I'm sorry. It's a fool who will never say my bad. It's a fool who will never apologize for anything, for anybody. And please let me help you. Jesus says here, before you come get your praise on, if you know you've done your brother or your sister wrong, before you get here, you turn around and you go and you make it right with them. Yes. He, he, he said, no, 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 what he said. He says, verse 23, for if thou bring thy gift to the altar and thou remember, notice this, not that, you, but not that you have something against your brother. He says that your brother have something against you. That means that you have offended somebody. And let me help somebody. Saying I'm sorry, Deacon Wallace, doesn't make us weak. It really makes us strong. But let me lay caveat in there Miss Welch now your apology is only as good as your behavior change help me somebody 
I mean, I don't want you to keep doing the same old thing and come back apart. Same old thing. At some point, if the, if, if the apology is going to mean anything to me, your behavior has got to change. He says, you go clean up what you have messed up. Clean it up. Somebody shout, clean it up. It, it, if you want to read some good reading on cleaning it up, read the little book of Philemon. That's in the New Testament. I know y'all never heard of it, but it's, it's, it's in there. It's, it's a little book called Philemon. And Philemon owned a slave by the name of Onesimus. And some way, o o Onesimus had run away from, o um, um, from, had, had, uh, run away from the slave master, Philemon, and uh, he had gotten saved under Paul's ministry. And then Paul sends a letter back to, Philemon, back to Philemon with Onesimus basically asking Philemon to forgive him. Why? Because Philemon was also saved. And what Paul was telling Onesimus is you got to go back and clean up. See, some of that stuff, God, God, God going to clean you up. It didn't my own. God is going to clean you up, but once he cleaned you up, you got to go clean up some stuff that you messed up. Number one, notice what he says in verse 23 and 24. He said, leave that gift at the altar and go thy way and first be reconciled. Glory to God. Be reconciled to thy brother. Go and just say, brother, I'm sorry. I offended you. I was having a bad day. Forgive me. And once you do that, that and, watch this, and that's all you can do. All you can do is apologize. All you can do is follow the precepts of God. Now, whether they forgive you or not, that's between them and God. But you got to do, can I give y'all some just practical stuff? You got to do what God expects and requires you to do. He says, now once you straighten it up with your brother, then come and offer your gift. Verse 25. He says, agree with that adversary quickly because your brother has become your adversary. While thou art in the way with him, watch this, least any, I'm in verse 25, at any time thy adversary delivered thee to the judge and the judge delivered thee to the officer and they cast you in prison. So why would they cast you in prison if you write? Well, y'all not getting the text here. Why would they cast you in jail if they offended you. He's not talking about somebody that's offended you. He's talking to somebody that you have offended. He said, go make it right with them quickly. Because if you don't, they're going to take you to the court. And the judge is going to sentence you, you. And you're not coming out of jail until you pay the ultimate price. Until you pay the penalty. What is he saying? He's saying, if you wrong somebody, go make it right. Hunt your neighbor you came with and said, just make it right. Bump me and see, man. Number one, clean up. I'm teaching Ben, y'all talking. Clean up what you messed up. And if, the, and if the Holy Spirit is moving in your life, the one you need to straighten it up with, God already put it on your heart. Because as soon as I said you offended them, uh, that name came up and you want to not erase the name. The devil is a lie. Go and clean up what you messed up. Principle two. Nip sin in the bud. Eradicate sin. Pastor, if you're going to exegete this text, show me where it says nip sin in the bud. Look at verse 27. You have heard that it was said of them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery is when you are married and you have sexual relations outside of your marriage. Okay, let me say that again. Adultery is when one of the persons having relations, sexual, is married. Or both of them are married to somebody else. Or some of y'all getting mad uncomfortable. He says, you have heard it said in the time of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. Seventh command. He says, but I'm sorry. He says, I'm sorry, Exodus 20, 14. 
But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman, get this, or a woman look on a man, to lust after him or her, have committed adultery. Now the word adultery, adultery there in fornication, when you read these words in the Bible, they have what's called semantic range. And what is semantic range? I'm glad you asked. Semantic range is a word can mean different things. For example, this word here not only means adultery, it means fornication, it means pedophilia, it means pornography, it means any sexual sin. So notice what he says here. That whosoever looking on a woman, looked at her, have committed a sexual sin or adultery with her already in his heart. So on the surface, Candace, on the surface, Anne, on the surface, uh, evangelist, it looks like this is about adultery. But it really not. Let me prove it. He says, but, but I say unto you, who's, who that's whoever looketh on a woman, to lust after her, look, on the line of the word, look and lust. Watch this. Here's what happened, Tanya, Brian. Adultery, get this, is a product of lust. You're not going to sleep with anybody genuinely that you don't desire or have strong desires for. Hmm? So, he's saying it ain't about adultery. It's really about lust. But it really ain't about lust. It's about, because lust is a product of your look. Okay, boy, y'all, y'all, y'all missing this. He says the end result is adultery. But what precedes the adultery is strong desire for something that you're not supposed to have. And what precedes the strong desire of something that you're not supposed to have is the ungodly look that you have when you look at somebody that you know somebody else got papers on. Preach, pastor. So it's not about the adultery. It's about the look. And let me lay this in your lap. Women, I know you fine as wine as the Georgia pine. But every man looking at you ain't lusting after you. Boy, y'all mighty quiet this morning. Let me say that again. Every man looking ain't lusting. And men, let me lay this in your lap. Every woman that smiles and speaks don't want you. See, you can look and not lust. You can look and admire. You can look and, 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 and not have strong sexual desire. But what he's saying is, I need you to nip these wrong looks in the bud. See, some of you men, let me help you. Every woman you see is a piece of meat. Okay, y'all getting, y'all getting quiet. I mean, every woman you see, but some of y'all are so uncomfortable. Uh, 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 every woman you see that's fine becomes somebody for you to conquer. Something for you to get to, you got to have. But what Jesus is saying here is, you need to nip the ungodly look and arrest the look before it become a lust. Talk to me. Because if it, if it becomes a lust, it's going to materialize into adultery. He says, but if I could stop the look, that's desiring stuff. Mm. How, Pastor, how do I stop the look? I'm glad you asked. Second Corinthians 5, 10 says, bring all your vain imaginations under captivity. When you start looking, you bring your thoughts unto captivity. I don't care how fine he is. I don't care how fine she is. You don't call. See, okay, let me just, can I keep it 100? See, saints, church folk get on my nerves. <laughs> I mean, in that they act like when they got hooked up, everybody but their spouse certainly became ugly and unattractive. How many of y'all in here know, now, I, now, now, now you married folk, y'all chill. 
But how many of y'all know that just cause my wife married me, just cause she got the best, that doesn't mean that there are other good looking men out there. And there are men she see that she'll take a second look at. May even take a third. <laughs> but that does not mean she wants to replace them with me. That simply means that God made more than one good looking man. I mean, I mean, come on, y'all. I tell you what you do. I tell you what you do. Why did now? I hope no, uh, nobody in here married spouse get mad. Raise your hand if you married. Hold on a minute. And you hadn't seen one good looking person since you've been married. Now lie. Now tell the lie. Come on, sign this paper. Here it is. Come and sign your name if you hadn't seen one good looking person that's a member of the opposite sex since you've been married. I'll wait. Come on, deacons. Come on, preachers. Musicians. Everybody looking ain't lusting. He said, he said, am I helping anybody? He said, he said, nip it in the boat. How? Galatians 5, 16. Walk in the spirit. You can't lust after him. I don't care how fine and bald-haired he is. You can't lust after him if you're in the spirit. He said, walk in the spirit. And see, when you walk in the spirit, when you see somebody fine as wine, you just say, Lord, you did a good job. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And move on. I'm trying to help somebody see because saints want to act like folk don't look good to us. The devil is a lie. Some folk look real good. And another time and another place, maybe y'all could have hooked up, but it ain't that time and it ain't that place. So you just going to look and say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, and move on. God, where is mine? Tell you, am I teaching that Ben they talking? See, because if I was, you, you, see, because if I don't give you any practical stuff, lust, I mean, I mean, we got a problem with lust. So I need to teach you how to arrest the lust. Stay in the spirit. And when you follow yourself drifting out of spirit, you got to come on back to the spirit, Ann. Come on back to the spirit, Snoop. Talk to yourself. Come on back to the spirit, evangelist. You know, amen, amen. Job, 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 Job 31. One says, I made a covenant with my eyes. And I'm determined that I'm not going to look at stuff that I'm not supposed to to look at why because if I don't control my look I can't control my lust if I don't control my lust I can't control my adultery oh this is good control your look then you control your lust then you control your behavior glory to God now then he goes on in verse number to, to, to tell you to, what, to do whatever is necessary to get rid of sin. What is good teaching? He says, verse 29, you're still on the nip it in the bud. Wow. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. <laughs> Wait, let me read this. And cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee, that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body shall be cast into hell. Verse 30. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. Cast it from thee, for it is profitable that there one of thy members should be perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Now, I need for you to understand the difference. Please get this. Those on Facebook Live, get this. I need for y'all to understand the difference between when the Bible means what it says and when the Bible means what it means. I hear oh, the Bible always means what it says. No, it doesn't. Sometimes it means what it means. 
Here's an example of when the Bible does not mean exactly what it says. Now, Pastor Dad, I ain't never heard that in my life. Watch this. Here, here, here's what he said, Brother Hunter. He says, if your right eye can't stop looking at stuff it shouldn't look at, take a knife. Pluck your eye out and cast it from you. I ain't making it up. If your right hand can't stop touching, hugging, rubbing, patting, stuff it has no business, verse 30, cut it off. Now, why did? Now, in the history of Christendom, have you ever heard of anybody plucking their eye out and cutting their hand? That can't be what it means. As a matter of fact, let's assume that it literally meant that. Teach, Pastor. Who would want to be saved if they came to church and half the folk in here had one eye and half the folk had one arm? And somebody said, why they all look like that? Well, that one couldn't stop looking so he cut his eye out. That one couldn't stop looking. Who want to be saved then? Nobody. I don't want no part of no one-eyed, one-armed church. And what it means. What he means is whatever, oh my God, is necessary. For you to get sin out of your life, be willing to do it, even if, in fact, you had to go to the extreme of cutting your eye out. How many folk in here know that if you put both of your eyes out, that's, gonna, that's not going to stop you from lusting if you've ever seen a fine woman? If you've seen a fine man, they can pluck both of your eyes out. You have a mental picture and you still can look. cut your hands off all you want or you still can sneak in there and steal something with your mouth. Y'all silly. My point is that's not, can I teach y'all the Bible? That's why I'm going through the Bible. That, I'm trying to teach y'all the Bible. That's not what it means. I'll never forget. I, I, I'll never forget. Boy, it's getting late. I'll never forget that I had a deacon, God bless his soul, named Weston Philpott. Good old, good fellow. Good fella, good fella, but I said one day that the Bible does not mean all the time what it says. And Weston jumped up, ah, oh, Pastor, I ain't never heard nothing like that in my life. I said, okay, Dick. He said, the Bible means, the Bible said that what it means. I said, cool. I said, Dick, let's turn to Matthew 5 42. So we turn to Matthew 5, 42. Let me tell you what Matthew 5, 42 said. We'll get to it later. It says, give to him that asked thee. And from him that would borrow of thee, not turn away. Now, that says, if I ask you, give it to me. Would you please give me your wallet? Well, that ain't what that mean. I said, that's what it said. But maybe it doesn't always mean <laughs> what it says. What he's saying is, nip, everybody shout, nip it in the bud. Come on, y'all ain't talking. Everybody shout, nip it in the bud. Now, I know I'm boring y'all, but I got to teach y'all the Bible. I've got one more point. I was going to try to get four. I've got one more, and it's going to take me at least 10 minutes to deal with it. Okay? So y'all give me another 10, maybe 15 minutes. Okay, so point, point one today. Come on, what is it? Okay, so, oh, okay, do I need to start over? Point one is what? Everybody say clean up what you messed up. See, 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 uh, y'all on Facebook can't see them, but some of these folks so bored talking about why did I go down here to hear that? But my job is to teach you the word of God. 
and to give you principles to live by. And some of y'all done messed some stuff up and y'all think all y'all can do is just walk back in people's life and don't say I'm sorry, don't say nothing, the devil is a lie. Don't you dare try to walk back in my life when you've hurt me and you've abused me and you've misused me and you ain't gonna say nothing. And you call yourself saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. No, say something to me. And nip it in the bud. Some of y'all sin is running rampant in your life. And you need to know how to nip it in the bud. Change your thoughts. Arrest it. Walk in the spirit. Make a covenant with your eyes. You see, when you start walking through the Bible, then people will start getting serious about their salvation. Hello, somebody. All right, let me deal with this found point for today, and then I'll let y'all go. All right? Number three. Number one, clean up what you messed up. Number two, nip sin in the bud. Number three, understand the seriousness of marriage. Let me say that again. Understand the seriousness of marriage. Can I take about 10, 12 minutes? Hello? I mean, well, I'm going to take them anyway. Understand the seriousness of of marriage. Look at verse 32. But I say unto you that whosoever putteth away his wife, let him give her a written of a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication or sexual misconduct causes her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that divorced committeth adultery. Let me clear some stuff up on marriage. Okay? Because Jesus here, go to, um, oh my God, De Deuteronomy 24. Let me clear some stuff up here on marriage as your pastor. If, if y'all got to go and this getting too boring, fine, because I'm going I'm to finish it. <laughs> 